It's the start of a brand new month and we're celebrating perseverance. Join us. Good morning. It's a new morning here on Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for joining us. We are so happy that you're here, friends. It's February 1st and National Get Up Day. Yes, get up. <laughs> Have you ever felt like giving up, but you didn't? Instead, you pressed on and persevered, and today you have an incredible story to tell because of it. Well, we would love to hear your story of perseverance. Share it with us on our Wake Up With Hope Facebook page. That's right. You know, in the Bible, God encourages us to press on, to stay encouraged, and not give up. In fact, in James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. Mm, so today, friends, on National Get Up Day, we want to encourage you to get up, pray to God, ask for help, and persevere with Him. He promises you a crown of life as you walk with Him, even in the face of trials. Yes. So let's begin our program today as we take a look back at what took place on this day in history. On this day in history, Giacomo Puccini, once an impoverished artist, established his name in the realm of Italian opera and also secured a substantial advance for his upcoming work. Freed from financial burdens, Puccini evolved from a starving artist to a burgeoning star embraced by the artistic establishment. This newfound stability provided him with the ideal perspective to craft a work that famously romanticizes the passionate struggles of the artistic class, La Boheme. The opera debuted on this day in history in 1896 at the Teatro Reggio in Turin, Italy. Hmm. You know, Puccini's journey from artistic struggle to acclaim resonates with God's encouragement to us about seasons of perseverance leading to eventual fruition. You know, in the midst of Puccini's challenges, God orchestrated a transformation that mirrored the theme of redemption found in the Christian faith. Similarly, we too may face struggles and challenges, but through perseverance and faithfulness, God can turn our seasons of hardship into opportunities for growth and success. We are called to trust in God's timing and to persevere with faith, knowing that He can bring about the beauty and purpose in every season of our lives. And I say amen to that. Amen. God can do it. Taj Pakleb joins us this morning as he takes us into the jungles of the Yucatan Peninsula to a dark underworld hidden from sight as he shares an important life lesson on the importance of being willing to step out of our comfort zones. <laughs> In the jungles of the Yucatan Peninsula, there's a dark underworld hidden from sight, a place of intrigue, fascination, and mystery. It is below the surface, hidden beneath the veil of the limestone ground we walk upon. In order to see it, you must be willing to move out of your comfort zone. You must venture beyond your fears and boldly confront the uncertainties of the unknown. You must penetrate into rocky portals and plunge into the liquid darkness. But it's in this deep, mysterious darkness that the light is more distinctly seen. The cenotes of Quintana Roo are the thresholds of the largest underground river in the world. The Riviera Maya is a 430-mile network of caverns and caves flooded with the only potable water in the region. This vast underground labyrinth is a life source of the flat, humid jungle peninsula. As rain falls, it's filtered through the soft, porous limestone, adding to the immensity beneath the rock. When the rocks become weak, it falls under its own weight, creating these massive sinkholes. A cenote is a wound in the earth that exposes the veins of life-giving water below. Considered by the ancient Mayas as the sacred portals of the underworld where their deities resided, fresh openings for explorers to see the glories of the underworld.
Most would never see it for themselves, but the explorer in me itches for adventure and thirsts for discovery. It is a place that is relatively easy to get to, but very hard to leave. As the light of the noonday sun pierces through the holes in the limestone rock, it creates spotlights of illumination penetrating the darkness below. The otherworldly scenery of the topography, mixed with the weightlessness in the water, combined with the silence and sound of bubbles, and the stark contrast of light and darkness is nothing short but epic. Being deep down here where most have never been makes me feel like I'm in another world. It's like I've entered into another reality and passed into a completely different dimension. A deeper dimension where the noise is silence, life slows down, where the stress of the surface is transformed into peace like a river. Words are inadequate to describe the surrealism of this sacred underground world. You must come and see and experience it for yourself. But just as beautiful as the scenery of the ancient cenotes are the sublime lessons it teaches to those whose minds take the time to sink below the surface of a mere outward adventure. As I've mused upon the message of the cenotes, here are some of the lessons it has taught me. A cenote is a sinkhole, a weak spot in the rock that has lost its strength to hold anything up. When the pressure from above and the support from below diminishes, the structure becomes weak and it collapses into the abyss below. So a cenote is literally a fracture that leads to a fall, a fault that leads to a failure, a weakness that is broken under pressure and has lost all strength to hold itself up. My friends, life is kind of like this. There are so many pressures that people face living in this broken world. Perhaps you yourself have felt crushed under the unbearable weight of this world of sin. Maybe every earthly support you trusted in has failed, and as a result, you've fallen into a sinkhole of discouragement and despair. Maybe people have disappointed you, political parties have frustrated you, friends have betrayed you, family have forsaken you, or society has discarded you. And due to the paralyzing pressures, your physical body and your mental health has reached the breaking point. Or maybe the failures of your own foolish mistakes have caused you to fall and you've lost all strength to hold yourself up. Well, if this is you, please allow me to remind you that just like the cenotes of the Yucatan Peninsula, your disappointment and fall doesn't have to be your end. It can be the beginning of a deeper illumination, an opportunity for the darkness within to be dispelled by the light from above a spiritual opening to something better than the stuff on the surface, a crack in our character that needs to be broken so that we can be transformed with a completely new purpose, a space where the empty caverns of our lives can be filled with new desires and new meaning. My friends, I want you to know that the great God of heaven wants to penetrate the deepest, darkest areas of your life. He wants to remove the covering you hide behind and pierce the hard outward exterior with the light of his amazing love and the warmth of his blessed hope. And when we allow the divine light to shine in us, our brokenness and failures then becomes redeemed for a deeper purpose. Our lives become a new opening, a fresh well from which flows a deeper and clearer revelation, an illuminating exposure to the surface world of the depth of God's beautiful grace and redeeming power. So don't lose hope in the sinkhole. All is not lost if you've fallen into the abyss. There is beauty in the unseen realm and sweet serenity in the cenotes of life. For God's light shines even in the darkest, deepest, and most discouraging moments. So look to Him in the darkness, seek Him in the cenotes, and He will guide you to the light. Emotionalism, have you ever found yourself acting on your emotions? Dr. Jennifer Jill Schwarzer joins us now to discuss emotionalism and how to avoid it. The next deadly psychological sin is emotionalism, or what we would call living by our feelings. I do cognitive behavioral therapy, and on my list of distorted thoughts, there's one entry called emotional reasoning, and emotional reasoning goes like this. If I feel this way, it must be so. 
So if I feel guilty, I must be guilty. If I feel like that person doesn't like me, then they must not like me. Emotional reasoning is kind of over-interpreting our intuitions and assuming that they never misfire or give us false information. Intuition is, is a wonderful gift, but it's fallible. So it's not safe to live by our emotions or to draw conclusions based on emotion alone. At the same time, we need to value our emotions. As I see it, they're like two-year-olds. <laughs> we love our two-year-olds. We listen to our two-year-olds. We pay attention to our two-year-olds but we don't let them drive the car. They're in the back in a safety seat. And same with emotions. Listen to your emotions, value your emotions, but don't let them drive the car. You'll end up in a, in a ditch. The replacement for emotionalism is living by principle. Living by principle. Remember that motion leads to emotion. So often as we live by principle, our emotions will end up aligning with those principles. In other words, we'll end up getting an emotional reward for living by principle. Let me give you an example. The story goes like this. Newspaper columnist and minister George Crane tells of a wife who came into his office full of hatred toward her husband. I don't only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he's hurt me. Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. He said, go home and act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to be as kind, considerate, and generous as possible. Spare no effort to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. After you've convinced him, of your undying love, and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him that you're getting a divorce. That will really hurt him. With revenge in her eyes, she smiled and exclaimed, beautiful, beautiful, he'll be so surprised. And then she followed through with her plan with enthusiasm. When she didn't return, Crane called her. He said, are you ready to go through with the divorce? Divorce, she said, never. I discovered I really do love him. Acting on principle leads us to believe what we're acting. I don't like the expression, fake it till you make it, because I don't want to be phony, but I love the expression, faith it till you make it. Act on principle by faith, and eventually your feelings will align with your actions. There's another way to combat emotionalism, and that's what we in psychology call cognitive behavioral therapy. We have noticed that life events lead to negative emotions in many people. But there's something that mediates between life events and circumstances and those emotions. And that is what we call cognitive processing. It's the way we think about those events. The good thing is that while we can't usually directly change our emotions, I don't know if you've ever tried that, but it's kind of like trying to keep a wave on the sand. You can't really change your emotions, but you can change your thoughts. And often when you change your thoughts, your emotions will follow those thoughts. And so what we do in cognitive behavioral therapy is we introduce people to various forms of distorted thinking. And we teach them how to make themselves accountable for how they're thinking about the events in their lives. Let me give you some examples of these distorted thoughts. Catastrophizing, making things much worse than they are. Mind reading, thinking you know what's in a person's mind when really you don't know. I remember preaching once at a church and someone looking at me like this and feeling really intimidated by that, just assuming that he was criticizing my sermon. And afterward, he came up and said, praise the Lord for that sermon, sister. It was really funny. It was a real lesson in the fact that I can't read people's minds. Another misbelief or another way of distorted thinking is negative filtering, focusing only on the negative. How about overgeneralizing? We see someone and perhaps he's done something foolish and we say, he's an idiot. Instead of saying the truth, which is that he can be thoughtless at times and he's made mistakes, but he has redeeming qualities as well. What about dichotomous thinking? Black and white thinking. Either we have fun on this camp out or we don't. What about shoulds? Sometimes people view the world continually through should glasses. 
I just look at the people in my life in terms of what they should be instead of accepting them as they are. And, and it, it really backfires because the more you should people, the less influence you have over them, typically. What about personalizing? That's a form of distorted thinking where I take responsibility for what someone else has done. Or what about blaming when I put on them the blame that belongs to me? Another distorted thought is unfair comparisons, comparing myself with other people in such a way that I make myself feel either too good about myself or, or bad. Those are just some examples of distorted styles of thinking. What we do in cognitive behavioral therapies, we help people replace those distorted styles of thinking with healthy, balanced thinking and basically learn how to tell themselves the truth. Once they're thinking more clearly, then their emotions start to match their thought life and they start to feel better. So living by principle involves acting on principle and thinking correctly on principle. And what we find ultimately is that the emotions will follow those correct actions and thoughts. And you'll end up feeling what you're living and what you're thinking. When we return, Faith for Today will be sharing a devotional blessing with us. And don't forget to search for us on YouTube to subscribe to our channel and keep up with us. Wake Up With Hope, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for staying with us. It's now time for a devotional thought. This morning, it will be brought to us by Roy Ice from Faith For Today. Even though his leg was in a pickling jar on the mantle, he could still feel it swelling and cramping and shooting pain up to his brain. The leg had been removed weeks ago, but the agony refused to go with it. His name was Mr. Barwick. He was the administrator of a medical school, so he should have known better. He had a serious circulation problem in his leg that gave him excruciating pain. As the discomfort grew, he began to torment his leg back. I hate it, he would say to his leg. His doctor had recommended that he amputate the leg, but he had continually refused. Finally, the pain grew beyond what he could stand, so he agreed to have the surgery. Before the operation, however, Barwick asked his doctor a series of very strange questions. What do you do with the legs after they're removed? Well, we may take a biopsy and explore them a bit, but afterwards we incinerate them, the doctor answered. I would like you to preserve my leg in a pickling jar, Barwick announced. I will install it on my mantel shelf. Then as I sit in my armchair, I will taunt that leg. Ha, you can't hurt me anymore. His doctor did as he asked, and Barwick placed that pickling jar up above his fireplace. Unfortunately, though, he suffered from a condition known as phantom limb pain. He had so much hatred for that leg that the pain had lodged itself permanently in his brain. The wound healed, but he could still feel the leg swelling and cramping as if it were still attached. This condition is not unique to Mr. Barwick. Many amputees experience the sensation of a phantom limb. They can still feel their fingers curl and grasp things. Their non-existent toes move. In fact, some feel so sturdy that they even try to stand on a leg that's no longer there. Phantom limb pain provides wonderful insight into the phenomenon of false guilt. We can become obsessed by the memory of some sin committed years ago. It never leaves us, crippling our ministry, our devotional life, our relationships with others. We live in fear that someone will discover our past. We work overtime trying to prove to God that we're sorry. We erect walls against the loving grace of God. Now, unless we experience the truth in 1 John 3 verse 20, which says, even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and he knows everything, we become as pitiful as poor Mr. Barwick, shaking his fist in fury at the pickled leg on the mantle. So what does the Bible say about forgiving yourself? Surprisingly, nothing. You can study God's word from cover to cover, but you will not find self-forgiveness mentioned anywhere. The Bible talks about vertical forgiveness, God forgiving a person, and horizontal forgiveness, one person forgiving another, but the Bible says nothing of the internal forgiveness, a person forgiving him or herself is simply not taught in Scripture. So then how do we amputate our feelings of guilt? 
This is what I found. A person who says, I just can't forgive myself, may simply be saying that they really doubt that God has forgiven them. So they take over the job themselves. Here's the real danger to this approach. The person who says, I just can't forgive myself, is acting as if they are sitting on the throne of judgment and declaring that they are their own judge. In this sense, the expression, I just can't forgive myself, is the same as saying, I'm in the role of judge, and I will hand out forgiveness as I decide. You've convened the court, prosecuted the case, and rendered a guilty verdict upon yourself, and now you believe that you must grant the needed pardon. But the Bible says that God alone can be both the judge and the forgiver, as well as the penalty bearer for those in Christ. This job description is extremely important. When you refuse to forgive yourself, you place your throne above Christ. Wasn't that Lucifer's first sin in heaven? Do you think you're wise enough to place your throne over God's too? Guilty baggage is the real problem. We've been carrying it around for years. Stuff we did in high school, the things we did as children, the things we did while we were immature in college, mistakes that we made years ago at work or in our relationships. It's, it's still right here and it's killing us. Listen to what God wants you to do. He says, I have put all your sins behind my back. God doesn't look in his rearview mirror and remind you of where you've been. He just wants to keep moving forward. He wants you to drop your guilty burdens and keep moving with him too. Our challenge comes because we don't believe that God would really just let it be like water under the bridge. We can't believe it because we can't do it. We can't let things go and people apologize to us. So why should God do the same for us? My favorite text on forgiveness is the one in which God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions and remembers your sins no more. Do you know what this means? God has chosen to have the worst memory in the universe. When he comes to you and asks you to do something and you say, well, I'd love to, but I'm really not worthy to do ministry. Remember the time when I, he says, what, what are you talking about? You never did that. Well, sure I did, you reply, and you try to remind him with all the juicy details. No, you didn't, God says, and holds up the book of deeds to prove it. It's completely blank. Not one spatter of ink can be found in the column of sins. The column of good deeds is filled page after page, but the other side is consistently unmarked. Then he opens up the Lamb's book of life and points to your name. See, he says, your name is right here. You are most worthy. Richard Hoffler's book, Will Daylight Come?, contains a wonderful story about letting forgiveness have its place. A little boy visiting his grandparents is given his very first slingshot. He goes out into the woods to practice, but he could never hit anything that he aimed at. He gave up and began walking back toward the house. In the backyard, he noticed his grandma's pet duck. Without concern, he shot a stone at it. And wouldn't you know it, the stone hit and the duck fell dead. He panicked. Desperately, he hid the dead duck in the woodpile, only to look up and see his sister watching. Sally watched it all, but she said nothing. After lunch that day, Grandma asked Sally to wash the dishes. But Sally said, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today, didn't you, Johnny? And she leaned over and whispered to him, remember the duck. So Johnny got up and did the dishes. Later, Grandpa came in and asked if they wanted to go fishing. Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make supper. Sally smiled confidently and said, oh, that's all taken care of. Johnny told me that he wanted to do it. Again, she whispered, remember the duck. Johnny stayed while Sally went fishing. After several days of doing both his chores and Sally's, Johnny finally couldn't take it any longer. He confessed to Grandma and told her now, that he had killed her duck. I know, Johnny, she said, giving him a hug. I was standing at the window and I saw the whole thing. Because I love you, I already forgave you. I wondered how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. So what are you waiting for? Let God forgive you now, once and for all, of all the things that you've already asked him for forgiveness and experience the freedom and hope that it can bring to you today. 
Amen. Thank you, Pastor Roy. And thank you for watching Wake Up With Hope. If you'd like to learn more about us or share us with friends, visit us at hopetv.org slash wake up. And don't forget to tune in tomorrow. At the same time, we will have an encouraging devotional from Pastor Mark Finley, health news and more. Join us as we start the weekend together. And if you enjoyed our devotional thought today, please visit hope.study for your free Bible study guides. And before we go, we have a Bible promise for you. Today's Bible promise says, And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. Mm, you know, friend, what special need do you have today? Give it to God. He holds the whole world in His hands and He promises to meet every single one of your needs. And that is a sure promise. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, today we want to have that sweet conviction, that confidence that our life is secure in your hands. You're able to handle anything and everything that comes our way today. Thank you for that hope that we have in the sweet assurance that Jesus is able. And we give your hearts completely today. In Jesus' name, amen.